If you ever looked at your watch at the end of a run and it's come up with this recovery time metric and it's just seemed like an outrageously long uh, amount. I did a run the other day and actually did a run today where it was a pretty sort of easy, uh, easy run today, hard interval run the other day and it's come up with 19 hours and 23 hours worth of recovery that I need to do before I can get into my next session. So what does this actually mean? Can we use this information usefully or is it just a BS number that we can just completely ignore and something that Garmin needs to fix? Find out in this video exactly what you need to know about this recovery based metric on your Garmin watches. Hey guys, Nick here. Welcome back to the channel talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Welcome to anyone who hasn't watched any of these videos before or if you're a new subscriber, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below or if you've been watching videos for a while and been liking them, make sure you also hit the subscribe button to keep up to date with all the latest content coming soon. Something I do want to get across was quiet last week, no videos and there's good reason for it. Here in Victoria and Melbourne, we were able to reopen uh, our testing facility where I work at Mets Performance. Uh, go check out our Mets Performance social media pages. All you have to do is search Mets Performance or Mets Performance Consulting. It's a little green running man logo. You can't miss it. But we do a lot of VO2 max testing and lab testing and 22nd of June was our first day to be able to re reopen, which is really exciting. Plenty of athletes through in the first week and plenty of athletes today. Uh, so hence why I'm filming a little bit later on tonight. But what it meant was flat out schedule, just couldn't get a video out last week. So apologies for that. I'm going to try and stick to this consistent one or two videos a week as best I can. Uh, if you do have any ideas though on what you want me to cover in some of these videos, it does really help. So leave them in the comments below. Is there anything you want to know about the science of endurance or sports science that we can talk through uh, in one of these videos? Definitely helps to, to get the ball rolling and keep the videos coming on a regular basis. Like I said in the intro though, today's video is all about the recovery feature on your Garmin watch. And it all sparks from the frustration in my own training, or I get to the end of a session, I get to an end of a run, I feel okay at the end of the run, or I feel exceptionally tired, and then this recovery metric comes up and it tells me I need to wait a certain number of hours before uh, before I can start training again. And it's very confusing to understand because a lot of the time you might go out and do an easy run. And I'll give you an example today, went out and did 7K, zone two, nice, comfortable, uh, conversational type intensity, really just trying to get some Ks in my legs and a bit of volume, do a lot of high intensity lately, so the capacity side of things have been lacking. So this is something I wanted to work on. I've gone out and done a pretty easy run. I get home and I'm like, yeah, look, probably could go out and do another seven Ks, but I don't need to do any extra, extra volume. So my body is feeling really, really good. It then tells me that I have to wait a minimum of 23 hours before I can go and do another session. Or the recovery time metric comes up and it says 23 hours. And I look at that and go, well, that doesn't really work because unless I'm going to go out and train only to, if I'm going to train tomorrow, I can only train in the afternoon because that's when I did my run. I have to wait at least 23 hours. So if I waited any longer than that, then potentially I went out for a run about four o'clock today, potentially it's going to start getting dark. So if I try and do a bike tomorrow, which I'm aiming to do, I'm not necessarily going to be able to get out in the dark and do a bike outside. I'm going to have to do a trainer set. That might be practical in terms of timing a day and other things going on. So it's the type of thing, if you're following it religiously, it can just be almost impossible to fit everything in. And particularly for a lot of athletes, and we've already covered this in a previous video, I'll link it above in terms of training on double days and making the most of that. A lot of athletes who might be training double sessions, you're doing a strength session in the morning in the gym, then you're doing a run in the afternoon, or you're doing a bike in the morning and a swim in the afternoon. If you get a thing on your watch saying 19 hours of recovery, you are not fitting in two sessions in a day if you're following that metric religiously. So. It's the type of thing that we need to look at, well, what is actually trying to tell us in terms of information? How is it measured? And then can we actually make sense of it a little bit more practically uh, as opposed to just this number coming up and sort of giving us a false false indication of what we should be doing. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna chuck it up here, a bit of a screenshot of what Garmin is showing uh, on their website. When you just Google, and it's very simple to do, I Googled, what is this recovery advisor feature on my watch or recovery metric on my Garmin watch? And their support center basically listed as the as the following. So, um, the the recovery advisor or recovery time advisor is an estimated recovery time based on how long it will take you to fully recover and be ready for the next hard workout. I want to emphasize the word hard in that sentence in terms of um, we need to then have a look at well what is their definition of hard? And unfortunately, on the Garmin website, it doesn't tell you. It's a difficult thing because hard means different things for every athlete. Hard workout is a is a bit of a vague term, but it's something that is is obviously factoring into it. So already we can start to see, okay, maybe that means if I go and within this period, let's say you've given 20 hours of uh, recovery time, or in my case, 23, I can go and do an easy bike tomorrow, and that's probably going to be okay within that that period. So if I went out tomorrow morning, I'd probably be okay. And you're going to feel that in training. It's it's obvious. If I go into a hard session tonight. Probably not going to try and back that up into a hard session first thing tomorrow morning. Going to do an easier one. 
or if I did a easy session tonight, I can probably go out and do a hard session tomorrow morning. I'm going to be feeling okay. We then also need a factor in volume can also add to hard and there's all these subjective things of what is hard. You're going to have to judge that a little bit for yourself and sort of and understand well, for you, what are the sessions you back up faster from, even without looking at any metrics, what are the sessions you back up faster from, what are the ones you don't back up as, as quickly from, which ones are easy for you, which ones are hard. I know I find the high intensity sessions a lot easier than the long slow because I'm more of a repeat sprint or intermittent type sport athlete in terms of training history, I need to get better at the aerobic capacity. So going out and doing 40 minutes of zone two long slow is actually a little bit more difficult for me than what it would be for someone who's been doing that years and years, but struggles with the high end. So there's a lot of little different bits and pieces that, that come into the puzzle of what a hard workout is. Garmin then goes on, I'll bring it up again, then goes on to say this recovery metric can range from anywhere between zero hours. So essentially no recovery. So if you just did a quick like, five to 10 minute, just easy, very easy jog, just around uh, your local streets or around an athletic track, just as a, as a flush legs out, you're probably gonna get zero um, on that reading. Or if you're doing a flush out, a little spin, 15 minute spin on the bike, you'll probably get zero. Anywhere up to four days, which I thought was absolutely bananas. And I've never seen that come up and watch and let me know if someone has had a four day period. I think the best I've had is maybe, um, I, I've ticked over the 24 hour period is the best I've got to. And that was after a 70.3, but for some for some people you probably might get up there maybe some of the Ironman athletes out there might be getting to that sort of range of the ultra athletes let me know uh, in the comments if you've, if you've seen four days but it says it's calculated using the training effect of your completed activity the amount of training time uh, remaining on your recovery time countdown at the start of your activity and first beats algorithm so it, it's all of the data being collected into the watch matched up with previous sessions. So it's actually a good way of factoring in, well, if I did a hard session on a Saturday and then I'm trying to back it up and do another solid session, maybe you're a long course triathlete, it's pretty common. Ironman, you might go out and do like a five hour bike on the Saturday and then try and run again, hour and a half, two hours on the Sunday, for example. It's gonna factor in, well, you still had five hours recovery time based on our estimation when you started that run on the Sunday because of the fatigue coming into your legs from the day before. So that's gonna extend out your recovery after this Sunday session, which is which makes perfect sense. If you do two harder days in a row, or two big days in a row, you're probably gonna need that third one as a bit more recovery time. And that's where you might get um, a full day or it might take a full rest day. What I'm getting at here is a bit of common sense really, isn't it? I'm not really talking too much in terms of metrics and data necessarily. Most people are gonna know when they need to take that extra bit of recovery or not. But this can obviously be a little bit of a way of just gauging that a little bit better and just give you a bit more information to inform those decisions of, yeah, probably should back it off a bit more today. Or yeah, actually, I think this is probably overestimating a little bit. Maybe we can just continue to push it a bit. Again, it's another tool in the toolbox that's never gonna be 100% accurate all the time. Similar to what we talked about with VO2 on your Garmin as well. It's never gonna be 100% accurate, but it's gonna give you a bit of an indication of where things are tracking. Two different types of metrics though, and what a lot of people, um, and something I didn't know until I did a bit of digging into this, is the recovery time metric that you get at the end of the session is linked to what your performance condition is at the start of the session. Now, I always had a bit of a mis misconception what this performance condition was and thinking it's just how you're performing in that run and I was or, or that session. And I was always very confused as to why it happened so early at the start. What it actually is, and again, straight from the, the Garmin side here, performance condition and in brackets they've actually called it recovery check so much better term i reckon using that recovery check than performance condition i think recovery check makes a bit more sense when we th when we get through it a sec but it appears within the first few minutes of an activity which provides you with a real-time indication of your state of recovery so you would have all seen that sort of like semicircle bar like almost a car um a sp speedometer type thing come up and it says like zero and it's just like, okay. And then it goes like plus three and it's good. And then you might get like, a, I had like a minus two today and it says average or, or or whatever it comes up with. And it's like orange or green, depending on which side of the bar it is. And it, it flicks across based on the session. That's giving you an indication of based on your recovery time from previous sessions, where are you sort of sitting in that spectrum? So that sort of makes sense for me in, in terms of did a really hard session on Saturday did a fair bit of walking, went out and hit, had, a, had a round of golf on Sunday, so it was a bit nice just to get out and enjoy a bit of sunshine. But in terms of doing a lot of, quite a bit of walking on, on the Sunday, surprisingly enough, walking around and being on my feet all day at work and then going out for a run, we now sort of end up with uh, a little bit of a, um, li little bit of a sort of not quite recovered, if, if that makes sense. So being able to then 
push it back the other way. And sometimes when you, you get that, that plus green, it's a good thing and you sort of go, oh yeah, cool, I'm, I'm feeling really good. It's it's an accurate indication of, well, you've probably had an adequate recovery as well to then lead into that session. That's why you're feeling good. So it's a little bit more of a, I guess, a, a different way of looking at something like your, your sleep quality. A lot of athletes might track their sleep or, or their motivation. Things like training peaks, you can get into the metrics and I've been trying to do it a bit personally lately and just note down each morning when I wake up how many hours sleep I'm getting, uh, what my motivation levels are like, what my stress levels are like. All of this just to track so then I can I can look back and see all right when when in the week am I am I hitting ups or downs based on my training cycle is that affecting some of my training something like this is a really good way just on the fly just to turn your watch on you start your session and it's going to give you a bit of, a bit of a, a little bit of an objective measure but just an indication based on the data that Garmin's been collecting is that actually are you actually re, well prepared for that session or could you potentially expect this session to be a bit tough or maybe underperform a little bit in this session like everything though we need to make sure that the data being collected is accurate so as i mentioned before the recovery time metric and ultimately the performance condition or recovery check um, component is based on the training effect completed in activities and the training effect is, from for all intensive purposes is going to be some sort of relationship between how much time you spent relative to threshold, uh, which is similar to if you use training peaks, it's like looking at your TSS, what is your actual training stress score? So the, the actual, I guess, objective value or, or quantitative value of how hard that session was physiologically. Um, usually it's a combination of, well, how much time did you spend in relation to threshold? But what we're gonna get here is if you've got inaccurate heart rate data, like the battery dies or it's not reading at the start. I know today in the first sort of KMA run, I'm fiddling around with my heart rate strap because it was reading super low. And then it sort of kicked in and heart rate started coming up. You forgot to put water on your strap. That's another thing I did today. So all of these things might impact the data and that's ultimately gonna impact what the recovery time metric is because if we have a look at the data later, my first K today was 20 beats lower or 30 beats lower than what it actually should have been in terms of heart rate and what it was reading. What does that mean? It means, well, that's going to be factored into my whole calculation of what my training effect was or, or essentially that how difficult that training session was or how Garmin perceives the difficulty of that training session. I just wanted to talk through today the, the this recovery metric because a lot of athletes sort of look at it and go, this seems a bit out. Uh, what's actually going on? What is actually being calculated here? Hopefully this is giving you a bit more of an insight. Um, we can go on about different parts of recovery, but I just wanted to focus right in on that metric because I think... Now that even I'm sort of talking through it here, I'm a little bit more aware of how useful that can be and, and use it as an indicator of where things might be at. But keep in mind, it is just an indicator. Um, it's not always going to be perfect. And, and sometimes you absolutely know, and I do it all the time. I look at it and go, nah, that's completely wrong. That's BS. It's not going to take me maybe three days. And like I said before, it says it's going to tell you up to about a four day range. It's, it's not going to take me four days to recover and I can go out and train tomorrow. I can go and train in two days time. Um, sometimes it's going to tell you really short recovery and you probably go, yeah, I probably need a bit more time than that. Listen to your body, but also consider the metrics and bring them together to have a nice sort of uh, combined approach. Hopefully you enjoyed this video today. What, what is the longest time? That is going to be the question of the day. I'm going to leave it down, to down the bottom. What is the longest time you have seen on your watch in terms of that recovery time metric? I reckon I've just tipped over that one day before. I don't think I've seen much more, but have you seen longer? Have you seen the full four days pop up? What type of session actually induced that or was it a race? I'm really interested to know who's who's been able to push out the furthest. Again, as always, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below if you're enjoying the videos and that's it for today. So we'll see you in the next one.